I'm not exactly sure when it happened, but at some point in 2009, God died. No one saw it coming. Just a few years earlier, everything seemed fine. Many people refused to admit it. Slowly, though, it was hard not to come around and accept it because the evidence just kept mounting up. You couldn't turn on the television without seeing some kind of a story that pointed to the fact that God was dead. And because God died, many of his worshipers lost hope. Their hope was in God. God was supposed to provide a secure future. God was supposed to meet their needs. Now that God is dead, his worshipers are terrified. Their security was in God. They feel depressed. They had found happiness in God. They feel lost. Now that God is dead, many feel like there's no reason to live. There's just nothing left. You see, your God is determined by what you put your trust in. And so for most people, money is their God. And when the economy collapsed, for many, God died. There are gods at war within each of us. And they battle for the throne of our hearts and much is at stake. For whichever God wins that war, gains control over us and ultimately determines our destinies. In scripture, money is most often portrayed as God's chief competition. Now money, of course, is amoral. It's not good or bad in and of itself, but it all too easily becomes a substitute for the Lord God. It's for this reason that Jesus spent so much time dealing with the subject of money. He talked more about money than he talked about heaven and hell combined. He talked more about money than about prayer. And when Jesus spoke on the subject of idolatry in the Sermon on the Mount, his only application was in the area of money. And here is his conclusion in Matthew 6, verse 24. He says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I was raised in a Christian home and had the privilege of attending a church that presented the gospel frequently. And when I was seven years old, I stepped into the center aisle and walked right straight down front and uh, asked to pray with the pastor that Jesus would come into my heart, and he did. I never doubted that God was my father, that I had been born again, that I knew him in an intimate way. And I remember thinking when I got out of school and sort of began the workaday life, uh, what do you do that really uh, defines you? And it seemed the most logical thing was to try to become as successful as possible in the business world. Everything that had to do with the internet was absolutely red hot. In those boom years, if you had any kind of idea that might work, then people got excited about it. So I started a company, and to my surprise, uh, I was able to raise all the seed capital in just a couple of weeks. We raised $1.2 million to start my company. Uh, I own founder stock options, a lot of uh, benefits with this company. A venture forum out in the Silicon Valley of California saw our business plan and picked us as one of the 60 best seed stage companies in the whole world. Money started chasing us. I was sure that my ship had come in. This was going to be the home run of all time. And I became very, very caught up in this. I'd made a deal with God. You know, you bless me and I will give you all the glory. And I began to work seven days a week. And by that, I mean every single day because nothing became as important as the IPO. I got completely pulled into this vortex of defining my life by the success of this company. My wife began to worry about me. She began to think that uh, this success might be devastating to us as a family because it had taken control of my life. I was glazed over. The lights were on, but nobody was home. I would come home from the office, I would get back on the phone, I would get back on the internet, and I would work, 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 work. And Anne wanted to know what happened to me. How did she lose her husband? I remember assuring her that nothing was the matter. I was doing this all for her benefit. 
you know, what, what, what was the problem with this? You know, we were going to get fabulously wealthy. One of the reasons money has the potential to become such a powerful idol in our lives is that we have a tendency to look to money to do for us the very things that God wants to do. And so we start to ascribe to money these divine characteristics. For example, God wants to be our source of significance, but we have this tendency to think that if we just had enough wealth, then we would be significant. We start to determine our value by our valuables. We think of our self-worth in terms of our net worth. We'll even speak of other people this way. We'll say, well, how much is that person worth? And we think of their value in terms of their income or their portfolio. Or God wants to be the one who satisfies us, but we think with enough money, then I'd be satisfied. In the Old Testament, a name for God is Jehovah Jireh, meaning the Lord will provide. And God wants to be the one to meet our needs, but we think if I only had enough money, then my needs would be met. All my problems would be answered. If I could just earn enough or save enough or spend enough, then I would be satisfied. And so people worship the God of money thinking that they can find satisfaction in a box or buy it off a rack or order it off the internet or drive it off the lot. And so we sacrifice so much on the altar of the God of money. We think that in doing so, we will find security, significance, satisfaction. And before long, we start to think that this God should be our purpose for living. The friend asked me one day if I had any goals. He said, people with goals achieve more in life, and it's proven if you write them down or yours written down. And I said, oh, they're just, they're in my head. I, I have them. And he said, let me tell you mine. So he opened his wallet, and he started reading me his goals. One of them was to have a gold presidential Rolex watch. He said, I think I'll have a gold presidential Rolex watch this year. But Chuck, I've gone even further. I've, I've decided to write down what it's going to cost me to achieve that goal. And I thought he was going to give me a dollar price. And he said, it's going to cost me uh, less time with my family. Well, I've got another goal. I want to be a member of one of the biggest country clubs in town. And I'm going to have to uh, give up one family vacation a year. And he said, that's what it's going to cost me. But I'll be able to achieve these two goals pretty, pretty shortly. And as he talked about that, I realized my goals are pretty similar. I started writing them down, the ones that were in my head. And I looked at my list, and not one single goal in my life was a spiritual goal. Not one. Every goal was around money and my work and my net worth. I was willing to pay any price to accomplish those goals. The more that I felt like I was going to be successful, the more I gave over to this uh, desire to take this company public, hit it big, and then turn around and say, this was all because God gave it to me. So I had negotiated this deal, and in my mind, I was convinced that it was sort of the perfect balanced portfolio. I had a little Jesus and a lot of money. My wife asked me if I would attend a Bible study with her to learn what the Bible said about money. There was this class offered at church called uh, Crown Financial Ministries course, and I dismissed it. And I could tell that hurt her feelings, and it worried her. And she finally came to me and said, I'm really worried about you. I think you're gone. I think you're uh, just completely, you've given yourself over out of concern for our relationship. I said, I'll go. Something happened to me that uh, dramatically changed my life. Uh, in the course, we were required to read the Bible. And I came to 2 Kings chapter 17 in verse 40 and 41. And in that passage, God is chastising the Israelites. And he said, you worshiped God with your mouth, but you served your own idols. And when I read that passage, it was as if the Bible itself had become a mirror. And I looked down at the Bible, and I saw my own reflection. That was me. That was me. 
they worshiped God, but they served their own idols. So the dichotomy was between worship and serving. And I never thought there was a difference. If I sat in church and worshiped God, then I was, I was complete, I was integrated. But this distinction said there, that you can worship one God and serve another. I didn't know it was possible, but that's exactly what I was trying to do. I'm an idolater because I'm serving money. And then the Lord took me to the New Testament when he said, you cannot serve both God and money. So begin to think, am I really serving money? And what's so wrong with that? Is there something wrong with serving money? So I asked him, what do you want me to do to serve you? And the answer came back, I want you to die to the love of this world and all the things in this world and all the things that you've ascribed to money, those come from me. I didn't have a money problem, I didn't think. It wasn't debt that was my problem. It wasn't budgeting or even giving. And like the rich young ruler who was doing pretty well with money, it was my identity. And Jesus challenged the rich young ruler to give away his identity. And at that moment, I said, Lord, I just need to confess, I am an idolater. Money is on the throne of my heart. It is invisible, but it has taken me captive. And I don't know how to get out of it. How do I transfer my identity into Christ? And to trust that if I do that, he's not gonna take everything away from me. That's what I was afraid of. I was, I was terrified that if I sort of let go of my grip on the world, because I had a pretty good grip on it, that God wasn't gonna treat me fairly. I got to Matthew 6 and he said, go in your closet and pray. So I did, I thought, you know, I've never done that. I, I had a little closet and I went inside there and closed the door. I stood there, it was completely dark. I looked up and said, here I am, Lord. And you said to pray. And I just want to tell you, don't take the company away from me, please. <laughs> I don't want to lose that. But if you're asking me to trust you with everything, and to find my identity in you, if that's what I'm wrestling with, then I'll let go of it, God. And I'll love you with all my heart and with all my soul. And I'm sorry that I fell in love with money. And when I came out of that closet, I was a changed man. If you pulled out a dollar bill, you would notice that there's a four word statement written on our currency. It says, in God we trust. The irony, of course, is that so many people have decided to put their trust in money. What would be more accurate is if there were a question mark at the end of that statement, in God we trust, question mark, because money does tend to answer the question of what we've put our trust in. So let me ask you, what have you put your trust in? If I could get a little bit more specific, what do you complain about? Does it tend to be your financial status? What do you sacrifice your time for? Would your calendar show that money is your highest priority? What do you worry the most about? Retirement fund, gas prices, house payment? What do you dream of? Is it something with a price tag attached to it? David said in the Psalms, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord. I went to New York City in March of 2000. And I went to the offices of Warburg Pincus, and they're one of the largest equity investment firms in the entire world. And they were looking at becoming my partner to take us public that year. And the very day that I was in New York City, that's the day that history records that the internet bubble burst. In March of 2000, NASDAQ fell. From 5,200, it lost nine points of market share in just two weeks' time. It started falling, 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 falling. And suddenly, my internet stock started falling in value just as rapidly. The window closed overnight, 
It was dramatic. It was over. It didn't sting any longer to have lost the things of this world. It brought to mind the passage in Hebrews 10 when it said they joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property because they knew they had better and lasting possessions. All of that striving, all of that yearning was gone. And God showed me that there was much more to knowing Him and the riches found in Christ than all the riches that I could have ever earned on Wall Street. We all have some price on our head, some bounty that we sell out for, something that we want more than Him. That's what an idol is, and mine was money. And my bounty, the bounty on my head, I have to admit to you, was $10 million. Ultimately, that's what I really wanted. I wanted to be able to say, I'm a $10 million man. I'm embarrassed. I would have turned my back on the Lord just for $10 million. But he replaced it with far more uh, than, I, than I actually lost because my life became so much better, my, my joy and contentment. And I look back and I think, how did I get trapped in that? It was my own prison. In my life, I've had seven friends who've committed suicide, seven personal acquaintances, all men, and they all have one common denominator. They had failed in the area of their finances. And it so devastated them personally that they took their own life because they didn't know how to deal with that loss. Their identity was in their net worth. And I think the Lord mercifully took that away from me that that's not your identity. About the last thing I wanted to do was to be involved in a ministry. In fact, I went to a friend and asked him for counsel. He was a pretty straight shooter. He said, well, I'd like you to go home and tell your wife these three things. Number one, between 40 and 60 are the highest income earning years of your life. Ask her if she wants you to throw those away in a ministry. <laughs> Number two, men don't respect men who go into ministry. They respect men who build big businesses and use that as their platform for ministry. That one stung a little bit. And number three, I don't think this ministry you're talking about in the area of money is really all that important. If you're gonna do that, join an important ministry. I went home and I sat down with Ann. She said, hey, how'd lunch go? First of all, I need to tell you, between 40 and 60 are our highest income earning years. Is it okay with you if we throw them away, if we join this ministry? She didn't blink an eye. She looked at me and she said, would you ask him a question? What years of his life would he like to give to the Lord? His highest income years or his lowest? I think it'd be a delight to give our highest income years in God's service. I said, secondly, honey, he said, men don't respect men who go into ministry. They respect men who build big businesses and use it as their platform. She said, well, you just tried that. <laughs> That didn't seem to be God's plan for your life. And besides, I'll respect you. It changed everything for me to hear those words. And I said, well, one more. He said this idea of teaching people about money is not that important. And she said, honey, I think it's one of the most important things you could ever do. I think it's why God intercepted your life on the road to Wall Street, that he wanted to use you to tell other people what idolatry really is. And you know, since that time, I've had the privilege of teaching people all over the world. I never dreamed that when I said yes to the Lord, that he might take away $10 million in stock options and provide back priceless, absolute priceless moments in my life that I could never have purchased or bought, never. The real problem with idolatry is that we look to something other than Jesus for salvation. 
So we trade what Jesus offers in hopes that something else will save us. We're lonely and we look to a relationship for salvation. We're depressed, we look to food for salvation. We're rejected, we look to pornography for salvation. We're worried and we look to money for salvation. We trade what Jesus offers for what a false God offers. But ultimately, that false God does nothing but reveal our need for a true Savior. Only Jesus is worthy of our worship because only Jesus saves. Could I quote for you the words of one of my favorite old hymns? I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I used to love money. I'm embarrassed to tell you. I loved it like it would love me back. And it was a terrible thing to fall in love with. But today I can say I love God. The greatest thing I could leave you with is that after hearing this series, that you could say, I now have only one master, the Lord Jesus Christ.